When I was in high school, we went on a summer mission trip to New York City. It was a, it was a great trip to uh, see the city. We stayed in Brooklyn at a church there and had a great experience. But one of my favorite memories of that trip wasn't exploring New York City. It was one of the last nights we were there and we were hanging around, playing card games with each other. Uh, and we found one of those you know, big five gallon jugs of, of you know, filled with water or whatever. And we decided to make our own drinks. And I think we started adding different things like lemon juice. We're looking around the bridge in that church, throwing in different things. And it, it turned into this like clearish liquid, like white clear. And then we found some, well, some bottle of Coke that was half drunk or whatever. We poured it in there. And we thought, oh, this would be cool. And we poured out a glass of it. It looked like dirty water. So we gave the name dirty water. And then uh, someone found some Kool-Aid, of course, and we got a Kool-Aid mix, and we threw that in there as well, and it turned into this, this red drink, and we started calling it, uh, not Bloody Mary, it was Bloody something, probably named after one of the leaders at the youth group or whatever, but it was, we thought, well, this is going to be a great drink. Everyone's going to love it. We sent it out for lunch the next day, and... Uh, as a teenager, maybe it tasted really good. I don't know, but I think as an adult, I don't think I would uh, want to drink that. It was just kind of disgusting, a hodgepodge of, of things. And, and we find that this is kind of similar to where, uh, what has been going on in this story of the judges that we've been seeing them, uh, this idea of they're mixing things together. They're mixing things with their, their faith practice with God and trying to form their own like type of religion. And it turns out sometimes when we mix things that we, we think, oh, maybe these will be good, it turns out to not be good as well. And last week we saw this happen with uh, Samson. Samson was trying to mix his role of judge with his, his love of women, and it kind of got him in a lot of trouble. And then uh, We'll see now as we're actually nearing the end of our time in Judges. And most people, when they're when they see, think about Judges, they kind of end with the story of Samson. But there's two other stories that happen after that. And these are really weird stories, strange stories that make it hard. I think that's why a lot of uh, pastors and, and people don't really talk about these stories because they're quite strange. But they remind us of the people of Israel's continual turning away from God, they're turning their eyes from God towards other things. And it really, these stories uh, illustrate the spiritual and moral decay of the people of Israel. And so we're going to see that in the life of this man named Micah. Now, not to be confused with the prophet Micah, so this is a totally different person. So the prophet Micah was a man of God. This person wasn't so much. He's not really a deplorable person, a person that is just kind of really awful. And he's not really this idyllic hero of the Bible. He's, he's not good or bad. He's kind of that everyman, kind of, in a sense, like you and me, but a person who has this false understanding of God. Uh, and he's, this false understanding of God is, makes him see, uh, seek after these false promises that he thinks this God has for him, leads him down to some false purposes. So the story of Micah starts out with Micah stealing 1,100 pieces of silver from his mom. We think, that's got to be terrible. What kind of person steals money from their parents? Of course, most of us are probably have stolen something from our parents in our day, but, you know, so... We don't know why he steals this money from his mom. We don't know what his purpose was. Was he trying to get attention? Was he thinking his mom owed him something? We don't really know that. But after stealing that money, his, his, he hears his mom call out a curse. She's cursing the person who stole her money. And in order to avoid this curse, Micah decides he should return the money. This is, uh, and so, uh, but what's interesting is that when she finds out what her son has done, she changes her tune. 
She, she, instead of calling out a curse, she kind of calls out a blessing and says that, may my son be blessed by the Lord. Kind of an interesting thing. In our uh, study from uh, Tim Keller, is we've been looking at in our small groups, he writes this about the man Micah. Micah is neither a very good nor a very bad person. If he were thoroughly evil, he would not have given the money back. But of course, if he were a good person, he would not have taken it. And what seems to have prompted him to return the money is that he heard his mother utter a curse, rather than feeling any pangs of conscience. We have here a person of very weak character, no principles. He is hollow, a man without very much substance within. So he's not this great man, and, but we see that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We see that Micah's mom, she she's, gets the money back and she does this strange thing. Instead of sending out a, a curse to about her son, she actually decides she's going to dedicate this money to the Lord. She gets that money back and she says, I dedicate the silver coins to the Lord in honor of my son. But then it gets a little weird because I will have an image car and an idol cap. So she gets the money, she's going to dedicate it to God by having an idol made. And then she only takes 200 pieces of that silver, or the 1100, and uses that to make this idol. So she's only dedicating really even a small portion of that. And then she makes an idol for her son, and her son is so proud and excited that he, he sets up a shrine in his home. And he gets something called an ephod, a part of the priestly garment. And he, he puts that in the shrine as well, along with some other idols. And then he declares his own son to be the priest of his home. It seems kind of strange. And then one day, Micah is out wandering around, and he meets this Levite. This Levi who kind of travels from place to place and not really sure why he does that. But he, he gets into a conversation with this Levi and he offers the Levi a job. He says, come work for me. Come to be into my house and you can be my own personal priest. Now, I don't think that was what the Levi was supposed to do, but he thought maybe this is a good job, so I should do it. And then Micah now is like, feels so proud of himself. He's got his own shrine, his own priest, and soon the other people in the community are, are doing the same. They're building shrines of their homes. And he declares then that now I know the Lord will be good to me because the Levite has become my priest. Then, sometime later, he's, you know, he's, things are going well, at least he thinks things are well with him. And this, this, this small group of men from the tribe of Dan, they, they come up and they're, they're kind of looking for a place for their, their people to settle. And they come across Micah's village and they're just checking it out and they're seeing all these different shrines there. And they, they meet Micah's Levite priest and they ask him for a blessing and so he gives them some uh, blessing. And they go back and they tell their people what they've discovered. And they decide then that they're going to go and invade this town and steal all these people's idols. And so they go in. And while they're stealing these people's idols and raiding this town, the, this Levite priest of, of Micah tells them to stop. He said, tries to stop them from what they're doing. And so the raiders, what they do is they offer the priest a job. They say, oh, you uh, be father and priest to us, they say. They, they suggest he be their father and their priest. And they decide to sweeten the deal. They try to trick and say, isn't it better to be a priest for an entire tribe and clan of Israel than to be the, the household of just one man? So, you know, you're going to be so much more popular because you're going to be a priest of our whole clan and not just this one person. So this, this wandering Levite, this priest decides that it's a good deal and he joins up with them. And Micah is furious. He, he starts chasing after these people and gathers a, a bunch of people to go with him and they're shouting at them, stop, what are you doing? And the raiders stop and they, they're like, what's the matter with you? Why have you called these men to chase after us? They're, 
What's your problem? Why are you chasing after us? And Moses is like, wait, what? what? What do you mean, what's the matter? And then he says this, you have taken away all the gods I have made and my priests, and I have nothing left. You've taken away the things I've made, and I have nothing left. The people of Dan, they just kind of laugh at him and say, watch what you say. We've got some short-tempered, angry men here. They might just get angry and kill you. And they just kind of walk away. And Micah's left just to lick his wounds. Kind of a strange story. This strange happening. What we discover is Micah has been practicing a false religion. And this false religion is filled with false promises, which lead to a sense a false purpose. So we think about false religion. Now, we could be thinking about, you know, all these other religions out there, your Buddhism or uh, Muslim or all these other religions, you might say these are false religions. But that's not what I, I want to get at today. We could talk about that at another time. But this religion, this false religion that Micah is practicing, I would say, is much worse. It's where he's mixing his worship of God with other belief practices. He's, he's blending his worship, his, his spiritual practice of God by taking other things and adding it to it. Like I made that disgusting drink and said, oh, this is sound good. We'll just throw this in there, we'll throw that in there, and we'll add you know, idol worship, and we'll add these things. And, it just, this will turn out to be really good. And that was the false religion that he was following. This is a, you know, common. we've seen this throughout our time here. We know that God, when he called the people of Israel to drive out the other nations, we talked about this early on in the series, it wasn't because God hated these other nations or he thought they were despicable. It's because he knew that these people would begin to contaminate and, and the people of Israel. He knew that the people of Israel were too weak to, to, to not be susceptible to this stuff. And so he wanted them to, to send them away so that they wouldn't be tainted by other religions. But Micah himself begins to have this mixed up practice of worship. He, he mixes you know, his worship of God, or who he says his God is, with his idols, and he's got this deep body. And it's something he's maybe he's learned it from his mother. You know, his mother has this weird sense of where she's going to dedicate this money to God, and then she uses it to make an idol and give it to her son. And he, and Micah, kind of promotes it in his life by setting up the shrine in this, uh, with his deep body and his household idols, and he, he kind of promotes this. Uh, false religion to his children by setting up his own son as a priest. And the thing is that this is something we can even see in our day, that people are continually mixing Jesus with other things. I think if we have Jesus and we add some other things, that would be great. That would just make it you know, perfect. You know, some people, we've heard about, maybe you've heard about this idea of the prosperity gospel. People will say, well, you know, if you have a solid faith, and you're strong in your faith, and you're going to have lots of money and lots of success and great health. And if you don't have lots of money, if you're not wealthy, if you're not successful in all your ventures, if you uh, have failing health, then you must have a weak faith. Because I think that having these things, having items and, and God are synonymous. And then there's this, also this, this idea of Christian nationalism. People who say that their, their political beliefs and their Christian beliefs are on the same par. Like that, that you uh, worship your, sometimes you put your political beliefs as well as what your, your spiritual beliefs are. You say, well, my political party says this. And that's better than, even if we know that the Bible doesn't say that, we hold that standard higher. And there's nothing wrong with being patriotic, but we hold, we have to, we can't hold that on equal playing field as your, your level of your relationship with God. So we have to think about that as well. People are just mixing these things and thinking these things, as we come together, uh, that could be our religion. But that it creates a false religion. And that false religion then is 
filled with false promises. Micah had this promise, this idea that he thought that God was going to be good to me. He says, I know the Lord will be good to me because now he's got this Levite as his priest. That his personal religion with his personal idol and his personal priest would yield, would yield him great favor with God. And we see that in our own lives where people have this kind of personal spiritualism where they create God in their image, in their own image, instead of allowing God to, to transform them into his image. We often have a, a self-centered religion where we think, we come to church and we think, what can I get out of it for me? You know, what, what is it good for me? What will God do for me? Oh, we, we sing a song. I didn't like that song. That song didn't make me feel good. Or, oh, I didn't really like what the pastor said that day. Or, I don't really like what the Bible says, so I'm just going to ignore that part. We think we can pick and choose what we want because it's all about ourselves and our own interests. And we, so we have God in our image, in our image instead of his image. And we expect God to do what we want him to do for us. And then when trouble comes along, we think, why is this happening to us? Why is God out getting us? But we've created this false religion with its false promises, and it leads to a false sense of purpose. Micah thought he had this purpose that people were loving him. They thought they saw his uh, shrine. They were acting, they were trying to be like him, sending shrines in their home. He had his priest. But then when that got taken away, when these raiders came, and he says, you have taken away all the gods I have made and with my priest, and I have nothing left. Without his spiritual trinkets, without his little priest to bolster his ego, he felt like he had nothing, no purpose. And we see that with Jesus and his interactions with the Pharisees. They were, they were people who, in a sense, they were practicing a false religion with their own, its own false promises. They believe if you worked hard and you studied the Torah and you, you followed the rules and the regulations, uh, then you would have a, a, a life filled with purpose. And you mix your worship of God with all these pomp and circumstance, and you will be righteous before God. And today we see people who think they have to have a works based faith. That they have to work to earn God's favor, like a or kind of be, do all these things and promote themselves, wear these Boy Scout merit badges that they think they get from God, thinking that's going to give them meaning in their lives. But Micah shows us that the the, uh, the false religions that we we tend to create are filled with these false promises, and they leave us with a false sense of purpose. The Bible helps us understand that there is true religion, and that true religion is based on true promises that bring true purpose. And true religion is not found in all these things that we're doing, they're found in a person. True religion is found in having an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus. And through that, he brings these true promises. This true religion is not found in striving and doing and having more and doing more. It's discovered when we humble ourselves and we free ourselves from the burden of false religion. As Jesus said, come to me. All who are weary and burdened. If you're weary and burdened and exhausted from striving through this false religion, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest, rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just being burdened by these false religions and these false promises because I 
in my true religion, promise true mercy. I'm here to give mercy to you, to show you that there's nothing you can do to earn my favor, but I'm going to give it to you freely. And we see that as Jesus spent time with people that the religious people were upset with, with tax collectors and sinners, and they were continually wondering, why would Jesus, why would this reputable religious figure spend time with such people? And Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What we need to understand is that none of us are righteous. None of us are these healthy people. We're all sick. We all need Jesus. That not even the, the most devout Pharisee, with all his grandiose sacrifices, is truly righteous. Jesus, he wants to pour out his mercy on us, pour out his mercy in our lives, this true mercy that is not earned, not something we have to work for getting this mercy that he freely gives to all who open their lives to him. Because this true religion, with this true promise of mercy, brings about a true purpose. And the purpose of this is not about ourselves and what we can gain in life. It's about what we can experience to others, what we can give to others. That faith and action go hand in hand. Jesus' brother, James, his half-brother, imagine being the half-brother of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. But he, he writes this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. And he has two things. The first is to look after the orphans and widows in their distress. And the second thing is to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. But too often, this false religion is because we've allowed the world to pollute us. But faith and action, as we spend time with God, as we develop this intimate relationship with Him that becomes unspoiled, as we get to know Him deeper, it propels us to pour out the mercy that He gives to us onto others. To those who need it, like the orphans and widows, the people who have been abandoned by society, the people who are on the bottom ranks. God wants to care for them. That's showing, uh, showing our true religion. Micah and his story helps us understand that there's a, a frivolity in false religion. That we this filled with this false promises this false purpose and the danger that comes when we mix our devotion with Christ with all these self-centered desires. And as we think about this false religion, if we strip away those layers of things that we think the God we think we need to pull back out, we're left with two possibilities. We could either end up feeling empty like Micah who says, what else do I have? I have nothing left. You've, you've taken away from all the things that I've added to my religion to make me feel good or feel like I have meaning and purpose. Or if we pull out all of those things, then we discover true faith, true religion that's found, that's found in Christ alone, the cornerstone. For the weak are made strong, and the same is life.